connect nearby seats by the segment that uh, links them, and then draw the perpendiculars to these connecting segments. And if I continue like that, you see that I'm constructing around each seat a cell, and if I do that for a large number of seats, I get something like that. The structure is called a Voronoi tessellation or a Voronoi diagram, and it is such that each generic point of the plane is in the cell of the seat to which it exposes. If the seats are located in a uniformly, randomly distributed way, we call this a Poisson Voronoi diagram. If the seats were in a regular lattice, this would be the nucleoside's construction of solid station. No, Voronoi diagrams are used in science and engineering either to model a natural system or as a means of analysis. And they're also studied for their own sake by mathematicians in a more rigorous way. In fact, in the review literature on this subject, you can find tables of exactly known properties of uh, Voronoi and Poisson Voronoi tessellations, uh, and a lot of things are known. <clears throat> now, I will ask a question <clears throat> which is the following. What is the probability Pn that an arbitrarily picked cell has exactly n <coughs> size? You see here a cell that happens to have, if you go around it, nine sides and also nine vertices. But the number could be different, and the question is what is the probability that it has n size? That surprisingly simple question has not received an analytic answer, and we still don't have it today. And the question has been asked since a long time. In fact, it was asked more than 30 years ago by Jean-Michel Wolf and Claudine Sixon in a paper published in Nuclear Physics and a work that they did, Jean-Michel talking when they were at CERN. Uh, in fact, their motivation was that they were interested in doing field theory uh, on a lattice, numerically. And for the small lattices that they could do at that time, they were bothered by the influence of the lattice anisotropy. So the idea was that if they would take a random lattice, they would at least locally have rotational invariance at all, at all spatial scales. That was the idea, and uh, of course, if you have points lattice points distributed randomly in space, you need adjacent simulations, and the natural way to define them is to do the Voronoi construction. So that is how they were led to the Voronoi construction, and then I suppose it was the numerical implementation of that idea that led them to the question, what is the probability if I have some central C that it have exactly n neighbors? And they focused in their question on um, the um, problem of what is the probability to have a very large number of neighbors. <clears throat> and they uh, did analytic work, but before describing that, let's go and see what we know about this problem. You can make on the basis of simulations a histogram of the number of sides of a Voronoi um, cell, and this histogram <laughs> takes at six, in fact six is the exact average, and then it goes down very rapidly for high values of n. That's a question there. Yeah, so how are, you, how are you picking the cell? Are you picking a random point in the plane or a random point from your Poisson process? A random point, a random cell. All cells with equal probability. Each, okay. So now if you do a naive simulation, then the probability to have a, say, a 15-sided cell is less than 1 million, and the probability to have a 19-sided cell is of the order of 1 over 10 billion. Druff and Isaacson in 1984 guessed that asymptotically P of n <coughs> would go like n to the minus alpha n, with alpha they showed analytically <coughs> necessarily comprised between 1 and 2. And they devised an improved simulation method, and by fit to the data, they concluded that alpha would be rather close to the upper limit, alpha equal to 2. In fact, they simulated sizes of uh, n up to about 50, but we know now that their error bars were considerable, considerable as soon as n was above, say, 30. So their simulations were essentially limited to n of the order of 25, 30. Now, <coughs> I was really interested in that question a bit later, about 20 years later, and let's 
see first what happens is. Let us start from the analytic expression for the probability of having n sides that you see here. And that was also the one that Jean-Michel and Claude started from. In fact, suppose there is a central cell fixed at the origin. And let's now ask for the probability that there are exactly n neighboring cells. You can write that as an integral on um, the uh, two-dimensional coordinates of uh, n uh, seeds that you want to be their neighboring uh, the, cell, the seeds of their neighboring cells. And then the integrand has two factors. You can understand easily both of them. The first one is an indicator function. It's equal to either 0 or 1. <coughs> it is equal to unity if and only if the n seed positions in fact, after the Voronoi construction, lead to n sides connecting the central cell to these n cells. The next term is an exponential that you can understand also easily. For a given set of first neighbor positions, what happens to all the other seeds that there are in the plane? Well, they should stay out of the way. They should not interfere with the adjacency relations that have been defined by these positions. So there is a well-defined area that depends on these positions. I call it a sub n, and we'll come back to it. A well-defined area that is excluded to all the other to all the other seeds in the plane. And if the seed density is rho, everywhere else I will set rho equal to one. But if the seed density is rho, then this probability is exponential minus rho times the area of that uh, of that excluded volume. Now, my contribution was to find a correct set of variables. I will show it to you in a while. A correct set of variables that allowed me, after uh, an enormous calculation, to eliminate this function chi, which implies a set of uh, complicated nonlinear constraints. And finally, to cast this n-fold integral in the form that you see here. There is, first of all, a factor up front. And then there is this C2 in red. C2 is still a 2 n fold integral, but now in the new variables. And the new variables have the pleasant property that you can look for a maximum in phase space. You can find it, expand around it, diagonalize, and then finally do the integration with the result that in the limit n to infinity, in fact, this should not be there, in the limit n to infinity, if and when you take it, C2 appears to be a constant. That is shown on the next transparency. You find that C2 is equal to an infinite product. Each factor of the product corresponds to the contribution of one of the integrations of the decoupled modes of the system. What are these decoupled modes? Well, <coughs> Drew and Itzikson assume that in the limit of a large number of sides, the shape of the cell would tend to a circle, and they were certainly right. But there are deviations from circularity. Truth and Isikson were aware of that, and they treated deviations from circularity by considering approximately the n-sided cell as a perturbation of a regular n-sided polygon. Here, in terms of the new variables, when I do the integration, I integrate on all the <coughs> Uh, elastic deformations, if I may call them that way, of the uh, cell away from circularity. And if I call them elastic, of course, that is elasticity in parentheses of, uh, uh, of uh, entropic origin. So C2 turns out to be a constant, and proving that is essential in order to be able to call the result, to qualify the result as exact, is a constant after we do an over n, one over n expansion. There are correction terms that I don't know how to calculate. Now, that calculation completed, we therefore have the answer to the question, what is the asymptotic behavior of the sidedness probability p of n in the limit of large n? That calculation, however, gives us much more than <coughs> this simple answer. There are many byproducts. One byproduct is that effectively, as had been supposed, the many-sided cell becomes circular. The circular shape is where you have the maximum in phase space. And it becomes circular of a radius that is well-defined. It goes as the square root of n 
<coughs> divided by the square root of 4 pi. So we now know uh, what the size is <coughs> of the uh, uh, spherical cell in the limit of large n. There was a second and important byproduct of this calculation. In fact, it was a very different story, but that I will not give the details of. <coughs> I was able to devise an, a very efficient algorithm to generate unbiased uh, <coughs> uh, instances of many-sided cells. Oh, I'm first saying something else <coughs> before I will go to the many-sided cell and to this algorithm that I started talking about. There was still the promise that I would show you what are these variables in which this problem becomes doable. In fact, that is very easy. You see here an n-sided cell, and there are two types of spokes going from the C to uh, outward. There are the red spokes that go from the center of the cell to the vertices, and the angles aterel are the angles between two successive red spokes. There are also the blue spokes. The blue spokes are perpendicular to the sides or to their extensions. And the angle between two successive blue spokes are called cyan. The angles HRL and cyan, or are two n angles, are the new variables in which you have to formulate the problem if you want to solve it. And they are variables which, in the limit of large n, become independent, identically distributed stochastic variables. That was just a uh, uh, remark to satisfy your curiosity about what these variables are in which you can solve the problem. Now, now back to the second byproduct of this calculation. I told you there was an efficient algorithm. And here you see one of the results. I have constructed a cell of 96 sides, an honest, unbiased example. <coughs> The probability, if you would do a naive Monte Carlo simulation, to hit on a cell of that type is 10 to the minus 177. Obviously, we're here in the realm of extreme statistics of large deviations. Now, what are the things that strike? The cell that you see here is the white area with the C more or less in the center. The cell is more or less circular, but not quite. So we're still not in asymptosia. <clears throat> Furthermore, what spikes is that the first Taylor seeds, the red dots here, begin to form an almost continuous line. <clears throat> As a consequence, the first Taylor cells are very elongated. Okay, let that be as it is. Now, now I would like to draw your attention to the following thing. <clears throat> Uh, I talked about the excluded volume, of the excluded area, in fact, that I call A. Here you see what is the excluded area. It is the area within this red curve. Obviously, any of the red seeds outside should not be allowed to go inside this excluded area because that would destroy the adjacency relations between the first neighbor and the central seed. So we see that there is an excluded area which is in the limit n to infinity, also circular, and which has a radius equal to twice the radius of the, uh, of the, uh, of the central cell. Now let's look more closely at that statement. This, ideally, is the exploded area. It has a radius 2r, where r is the expression that I showed you a minute ago, and if I substitute the value that was in the previous slide, I find that the excluded area a is exactly equal to pi times 2r squared, which is equal to n. Now, would that be a coincidence? It is as though if you have a central seed here, and you impose the condition that it had exactly n neighboring seeds, then what you should do is evacuate an area exactly equal to n around this seed, and put all the, all the seeds that you have evacuated on a narrow, in a narrow shell around the edge of this disk. That seems to be what happens here, and we will see later that this is sort of a principle. Now, when I tell this story, there are always two questions that people ask. First thing is, <coughs> 
can you see all this more easily? And second thing is, can you apply it in higher dimensions? So let me say something about both questions. First question, can you see this more easily? <coughs> the answer is yes, at least in part. And here comes the argument. I can do the following thing. I have dots randomly distributed and uniformly in the plane, and I ask what is the probability that around a central dot there is a sphere of radius 2r that is empty, whereas at the same time I have n dots in, a, in an annulus of width w. Now, for independently distributed dots, you can easily calculate that, and there is an entropy cost to that, which depends on w and r. An entropy cost, of course, with respect to the completely random configuration. That's one thing. You can write down the entropy cost. Now, secondly, taking into account that there have to be adjacency relations between the dots, the seeds in the annulus and the seed here, I can more or less heuristically try to see how much I can wiggle any given dot in the radial direction without perturbing the adjacency relations. And that is a heuristic <coughs> way of reasoning. I will not do it for you, and it leads you to the relation that W is, should, be, should go down when R goes up, and should go down as the three half power of R. That means that your entropy cost still depends only on R, and if I maximize <coughs> the entropy under constraints, if I minimize the entropy cost, then I find again that the radius, the preferred radius, is n over 4 pi to the 1 half, the exact answer that we have found before. So there is an approximate argument by which you can get at least one result exactly. However, you cannot get the P of n, the asymptotic behavior that I had shown to you before. Now, can we do something with that in three dimensions? Well, what is the three-dimensional analog? I have three-dimensional Poisson Vaubernoy cells, and I can ask what is the probability that a cell has exactly n faces. The number of faces is, on average, of a three-dimensional Voronoi cell is something like 15.37, etc. It's an irrational number, but it's known. Now I can ask what is the probability Pn, and in particular in the limit large n. I don't know how to do the calculation, but we could apply the entropy argument. Again, we will now say that there is a spherical excluded volume equal to n, and that means that the radius of an n-sided three-dimensional cell is equal to what you see here. It increases as n to the power of one-third. That is a result that we can at best call heuristic and approximate, and <coughs> That's where I left the game around 2009. Until, until one or two years ago, there was an, an American, John Martin postdoc, he did his thesis at Princeton, then went to Columbia, I believe he's now at, at uh, Penn State, uh, Emmanuel Lazar, who did Monte Carlo simulations of three dimensional plus one for noise cells, and he produced an enormous amount of statistics of the cells, their faces, their edges, and so on. So we looked together at these statistics, and we concluded that if you look at the statistics of the n-phased cell, there is a very good agreement for this formula for R. OK, fine. So that, was, that gave some confidence in the heuristic <coughs> method, but it did not help us to find this P of n. And still today, I don't know how to calculate it. However, his statistics also concerned another quantity. It concerned the statistics of the faces of these three-dimensional cells. You can select a face, and you can ask, what is the probability that that face had n edges? That is a problem that looks much more like a two-dimensional problem. And I slowly began to realize that there are similarities there. So let us now look at a face between two three-dimensional Poisson Voronoi cells. And now we have to do some geometry in three dimensions. I have drawn here two seats at the positions L1 
and L2 symmetrically below and above the origin along the z-axis. The two seeds are, uh, have cells around them that are separated by a face that the two cells have in common, and that is the white area here, which is supposed to be in the xy plane. Now, let us ask what is the probability that this face has exactly n edges. Look at one edge, say the nth one. This edge, like any edge in a three-dimensional Poisson Voronoi diagram, is common to three different cells. Which are those cells? Well, two of them are, you know, they are the cells uh, around L1 and around L2. But there is a third cell. How do I find the third seed whose cell has, seed, has this nth edge as one of its edges? Well, I draw the perpendicular, this red line, from the origin to the nth edge, and now I place myself in the plane that goes through the z-axis and is perpendicular. That's the plane that you see in the um, figure on the right here. And <clears throat> What you see here is now the point CM. <clears throat> um, what, what we know now is that the seed of this third cell that we're looking for should be at the same distance from CM as R, L2, and L1. That is to say, the seed of the third cell that we're looking for should be on a circular arc that goes through L1 and L2 and that has CM as a center. The radius of that circle, I will call it capital R, whereas this distance is rho. And of course, we have the relation that uh, L squared plus rho squared is equal to R squared. I'll write that down for later use. Now, <clears throat> I will call the um, the, the, I will call this third seed, whose cell also has the nth edge as one of its edges, I will call that seed Fm. And I have just said that Fm should be anywhere on this circle. Now, now we're hitting on an invariance property. Because, in fact, wherever on this circle we locate Fm, that will not change the position of the point Cm, and that will not change the position of the nth edge of this, of this face between two cells. And when that is true for the nth <laughs> first neighbor Fm, it is also true for any of the other cells that determine the positions of these edges. So I have an invariance, and I may as well, taking properly account of phase space factors, rotate this Fm so that it, so that it arrives in the xy plane and integrate only on the coordinates of the other seeds in the xy plane. There is a simplification that occurs, and that uh, makes this problem look like a two-dimensional problem. Now, it isn't exactly that, and there are interesting differences. First of all, <clears throat> the first neighbor seeds are located on a circle, as I have said, and now if we assume circular symmetry, as uh, it's reasonable to do, then, in fact, the collection of first neighbor seeds, in fact, are on a surface that I obtain by rotating this circular arc around the z-axis. What I get is a torus, but a torus <coughs> without a hole. So I get this figure. I don't quite know how to draw it, but it looks like an apple, people have remarked. It's a torus without a hole, and on the surface of that torus, we find all the n positions of the first neighbors that determine its interface. <coughs> now, now comes the question, what happens in the limit of large n? What conclusion can we draw? <coughs> In fact, there is one question that, when you think about it, uh, immediately arises. That is the following question. <clears throat> if I use the entropy argument, then the, um, 
volume of this torus, the volume of this torus that I get by <coughs> uh, rotating this circular arc around the z-axis, that volume should be equal to n, again, that is the general principle that we found from the entropy argument. But when I have a torus of volume n, that does not fix its two radii. It has a radius r and a radius rho. And so <coughs> I, the entropy argument is not sufficient to say what will happen in the limit n to infinity, what will happen to the radius r, to the radius rho, and as a consequence to this distance l between, between, the, two, um, between the two central seats. <coughs> And now I could, uh, now I'm thinking again of the remark that yesterday Jean Bernard Zubert uh, attributed to Claude Itzigson. A good physicist is the one who knows the direction of an effect without doing the complicated calculation. So my question to you now is if the volume of this torus has to go to infinity, then either rho or r or maybe both have to go to infinity. Okay. Here. What will happen to L? Put differently, when I let n go to infinity and assuming that R and rho or both <coughs> go to infinity, what will happen to this distance L? In fact, I am now asking about the joint probability of finding an n-sided interface in combination with the distance L between the two seats concerned. A good physicist would know the answer before doing the calculation. I must say I was not in that category, and I did not know, and I had no intuition for the answer, even though I asked myself the question beforehand. So I had to do the calculation. I was in this lowest category of scientists who, <laughs> who was able to do smart calculations. <laughs> and let me now, on the next transparency, tell you what results I found. Here they come, and that's my last transparency. <coughs> we found the following things. <coughs> I consider two three-dimensional cells that share an n-edged face, and I let n go to infinity. As expected, the n-edged face becomes circular. <coughs> the probability for finding an n-edged face is similar to what we found in two dimensions, except in two dimensions we had an 8 here. It's a 12 now. We had a constant C2, there is a constant C3, but which in the same way is a product of the results of integrations on <coughs> deformational eigenmodes. Furthermore, the excluded volume, in this case, becomes a torus whose two radii are equal. So in the limits of large <coughs> n, I get a I get a torus, a <coughs> that is just at the limit of between having and not having a hole. That's how it looks. <coughs> and the radius of that torus, you can now determine, because you know the radius of such volume, the radius of that torus is given by the expression that you see here. It <coughs> it's both its radii are equal and they go up as n to the one third n. Now, now comes the interesting thing. The average of L, this distance, scales, of course, with a smaller power of n than rho squared and r squared that are equal. It turns out that that power that could still have been positive is, in fact, negative, and that the average value of L <coughs> decreases as n to the minus one-sixth when n goes up. In other words, if you impose on the interface between two cells to be n-edged, that exerts an entropic attraction between the seats of the two cells that are involved. These seats will preferentially be close together, in complete agreement with what, um, with what uh, Emmanuel Lazar found in his simulations. And that is probably the most interesting part <coughs> of the results that I found. Finally, we found an entropic attraction uh, we found an entropic attraction between the seeds, and we could make this a bit more precise. In fact, you can ask for the conditional distribution of that interseed distance L 
given that the interface is n sided It turns out that you can write this as a scaling function, which I call Q infinity, <coughs> of only the product n to the 1 sixth nL. And that scaling function takes the form of a uh, square times <coughs> an exponential. Let us see what the simulations are giving. <coughs> that, in fact, is my last transparency. <coughs> for the conditional distribution of L. Given that the interface is n-sided, we have the theoretical curve that is the heavy red curve that you see here. Now, for n equal to 3, a three-edged interface, the smallest one that can occur, we find the curve that is here, the dotted black curve. For n equal to 4, the maximum of the curve shifts in that direction, and it goes down. It goes down, and then it starts going up again. And for the largest value that we could do by simulations, n equal to 14, we find the curve that is purple here, and we see that there is, a, there, is a, there is a motion in the direction of the curve in the limit n to infinity, even though we are still at a considerable distance of the theoretical limit curve cannot say that the experiments prove the theory, but they are certainly fully compatible with the theory. And uh, we are now, <coughs> we now have the satisfaction that in fact we have a way of doing calculations even regarding three-dimensional Voronoi cells that give us a complete control of at least some questions and that lead to non-trivial analytic results that are in agreement with uh, with uh, computer simulation. So that is what I wanted to tell you. Thank you very much. In the two-dimensional case, you gave a picture with an exact simulation. You said you had an exact algorithm for simulating a cell with many sides. Can that, you explain? That was in two dimensions. In two dimensions. Can yes. you explain what the algorithm was? Oh no, that is a complete, a completely different story. That is, a, that's a full set action. <laughs> that was a separate development, and I wanted to show this to you to tell you what the cell looks like. But how the algorithm works, uh, that cannot be said in two words. It exploits the fact that asymptotically we know, uh, we know uh, what the behavior is, and so it exploits uh, many of the many of the things that we discovered during the calculation of the, of the exact formula. Uh, so it is an algorithm, in fact, that avoids the attrition. There is an attrition in any algorithm. Usually the attrition gets worse when n goes up. This is an algorithm where the attrition goes to zero when n goes to infinity. So I can construct you a, uh, I went myself up to, six, to 1,600 sided <laughs> uh, Voronoi cells and uh, uh, there is no problem in the middle. And so this probability, P uh, 10 to the minus 177, in fact, we know it also with four decimals accuracy. <laughs> uh, so uh, so uh, the PN is now under, under full control. Thanks. Have you looked at other distribution of points than Poisson, like distributions where the points repel, uh, like Geneva? Uh, not in the context of these calculations, no. In my, in, my, in my early days, 30 years ago I did, but that was to, to, uh, to look at simulations of Leonard Jones liquids and see where the, where, the, uh, 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 where the irregularities in the lattice appeared. I did the Voronoi construction for that sort of system. But that, was, that is without, without relation to the theory that we can do here. Gets much more, gets much harder if the points repel. Um, you said that the angles as n tends to infinity in the two dimensional case uh, become independent, but in the pictures it looks like they're uh, about the same size, and besides they have to sum up to two pi. So, can you clarify? Oh, the, the picture is a picture for a fairly small value of. Of n, I think I showed you a 20 sided cell or something. <coughs> Here it was. So, but even the, the 
don't take don't take the don't take the picture as a way to the other uh, you move forward because with many many points here it looks um the uh look like <coughs> no the, if you if you look at the angles uh if you if you do this if you do the statistics of the angles, you will find that uh, uh, you will. Well, what is your question? If that, I, 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 my statement was that they are random variables drawn from the same identical distribution, independent random variables. But they sum to two pi. They sum to two pi, but that's a constraint that in the limit n to infinity gets completely diluted. 